Good morning. A warm welcome to everyone worshipping with Nielsen Parish Church this morning. Whether you're here in person or joining us online, everyone is welcome. Uh, for those of you here in the building today, hopefully you've got the pew leaflet, so please take the time to check that because we're heading into that time of the year where things are getting very, very busy. But for the benefit of those watching online and also uh, to highlight a few things, uh, if you don't mind bearing with me for a wee minute or two here. Uh, first of all, this morning, our organist Karen is on leave today, so we are very grateful to have Mr. Bill Hutchison playing the organ for us. We welcome Bill to the church and thank you for playing for us, Bill. So in this coming week, uh, Tuesday evening, we have the Kirk Session meeting. Um, the papers have been out for a while now, so we're asking for elders to be in attendance on Tuesday evening at 7.30 in the back church hall. Uh, next weekend is particularly busy. Uh, so we have the... Um, what do we have? Oh, I saw <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, I'm getting mixed up because it's no in here. Saturday, oh, it's over the page, sorry. Saturday, the 2nd of December, is the Christmas coffee morning and fair over in the church halls at 10 o'clock until 12 noon. Um, the usual uh, home baking stalls and all of that stuff will be happening. If anyone's able to do some home baking, donations would be greatly appreciated. And if you could please liaise with uh, Barbara, uh, in respect to that. So that's next Saturday, the 2nd, at 10 o'clock over in the church halls, and it's on until 12 noon. On Sunday next week, the first Sunday in Advent towards Christmas, 29 sleeps if you're counting. Um, so next Sunday in the morning service, it's our annual gift receiving service, um, and we are asking, as usual, for pa in past years, donations of small selection boxes, and donations of toiletry sets for both men and women. Um, there's a few things that are subject to ratification at the Kirk Session meeting on Tuesday, but we anticipate the donations are going down to the Barhead Food Bank. So uh, that's next uh, Sunday morning service, the first Sunday in Advent. If you could, uh, if you're in any way able to help with that, donations of small uh, selection boxes and toiletry gift sets. And please don't wrap them uh, because they need to be separated down uh, at the food bank. Uh, also next Sunday, um, it's a village uh, Christmas tree light switch on event. Um, our halls will be open from three o'clock next uh, Sunday afternoon for various stalls that will be available, including our own hot chocolate stall. Uh, Caroline's organizing that, and as always, we're looking for volunteers to help with that. Three till 6.30ish. So if anyone's available to spare an hour, two hours, three hours, however long, please speak to Caroline. So that's also happening next Sunday. And as I say, the Christmas tree light switch on is about 5.30ish, and Santa will be around. So, yeah. Uh, so also next Sunday, I should have said, um, if I can draw your attention to the Nielsen Boys Brigade Christmas card delivery service. They've done this for many years now. So the first Sunday that they're... Uh, starting to gather them in is, is next Sunday. They've got a wee poster here which I'll leave over on the book board um, but they are asking if you could get your cards together in, an, in a, an envelope or something or in a, a wee bag or something and put the money for each card. 25 pence per card which I think is a lot cheaper than Royal Mail postage costs these days. Uh, and please bear in mind, they're only delivering around the village of Nielston. So if you've got cards to go to Barhead or further afield, um, they can't take them, unfortunately. Um, so please, just within the, the, the Nielston uh, village area. Um, and so that's for next Sunday and the following two Sundays, they'll be uh, taking Christmas card deliveries here in the church. <sighs> Anything else? I'm just double checking because I'm uh, inevitably I might miss something. So I think that's everything actually. So thank you for your attention, and I'll hand you over to Matthew now. <coughs> thank you very much, Robert. Um, as Robert has alluded to, Christmas is a very, very busy time, uh, especially this year. So please do keep your eyes on poster boards and pew leaflets and on our social media and so on, uh, because there's loads going on. Uh, not just next weekend, 
but all through the run-up to Christmas and beyond. <coughs> Sorry. As we approach the King, as we approach our God, we do so recognizing his full glory, recognizing the power and the might of God, and grateful that God would be our friend next to us always. We're going to open our worship with um, a hymn which talks about the power of Jesus' name and talks about the glory of God. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Hymn 458, if you're using a hymn book, but the words will be on the screens behind me. 458, at the name of Jesus. Let us gather in prayer. Christ our King, seated in the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, all power and dominion, we worship and adore you. Christ our King, King of kings, Lord of lords, ruler of all, we worship and adore you. Christ our King, you made us and we are yours. You love us with a love that endures. You care for us and protect us. We worship and adore you. You were born in a stable. You ate with sinners and tax collectors. Your crown was of thorns. We worship and adore you. We come before you seeking forgiveness. For when we do not give you the honor that is due to you, 
for when we fail to understand your kingship, for when we see hunger and thirst but do not see you, open our eyes, our hands, and our hearts, and forgive us, our God. When we see loneliness and poverty, but do not see you. When we see human frailty and suffering, but do not see you. Open our eyes, our hands, and our hearts, and forgive us, our Lord. You are our King, the upside-down King forever. You love us and care for us. You reign in our hearts. You fill us with joy and happiness, hope and peace. You ask us to love you and serve you by loving other people and helping those in need. Lord Jesus, you are our King. We are your people. Now and always. Amen. Um, I thought that we could um, maybe play a wee bit of a game this morning. Um, we could play one of, in fact, my favourite game shows, um, just to get us a bit warmed up. Uh, and that is the game show, Only Connect. For those of you who have not seen it, the idea is that I'll show you some things and you just need to tell me what thing it is that connects them. And uh, just because it's um, a Sunday morning and maybe our brains have not fully woken up, I've not used examples from the show. I've made up much easier ones, uh, ones that even I could solve. Uh, so let's go for the first one. Um, We've got four things there, four images, people, things. And what we need is what connects those four things? Planets. Absolutely. Um, we've got King Neptune up there. Uh, Neptune, obviously, is a planet. We've got Pluto. It's a planet. Mars, Mars, a planet. Venus flytrap. Venus is a planet. Excellent. Excellent. Um, what about the next one? They're all food, but we're looking for something a, a, a wee bit deeper than that. What could they be? Um, Georgia, do you know what all those foods are? Uh, we've got bread, uh, chicken, uh, a sandwich, and haggis, don't we? What, what do those things have in common? They are all foods that you can put in a can, but you shouldn't. Um, so, the next one. The next slide will explain. Okay, um, they're all foods that you can put in a can, uh, but shouldn't. Um, is our, there we go. So we've got, um, you can buy bread in a can, you can buy whole roast chicken in a can, you can buy haggis in a can, and you can buy peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in a can. I would, however, suggest you buy none of them. Especially that chicken does not look like something I want to eat. Um, so that was it. Um, so what about our, our next round? Our last round. There we go. We've got... a. Uh, Kings, kings. Yeah, we've got King Cobra. We've got uh, the king. Elvis is the king. And I think I heard a couple of places. Stephen King. Stephen King, the author. Absolutely. They're all called the king, uh, or or king. That's right. Um, and because it's me, we're going to throw in just one last. Um, Robert reckons that's from Star Trek. Uh, we may have to have a theological conversation. Um, anyone else want to guess who that last one is? Jesus, yes, absolutely. Um, that last one there is uh, Jesus, who we also call the king. Um, that's really apt because this morning is a Sunday that we call Christ the king or 
um, technically the supplication of the solemnity of Christ, the king of our universe. Christ the king. <laughs> Snappier. Um, it's the last Sunday of the liturgical year. So it's the last Sunday before we go into Advent, which is next, that starts next week. And it's a really great Sunday because it's when we celebrate that Jesus is the king. So we've been through the whole year. Jesus has been born. He's had his ministry. He's died on, his, on the cross. He's come back to life. He's spoken to his disciples. He's ascended to heaven. And now, Jesus is in heaven. He's in heaven and he is being crowned by angels as we see in that very famous painting. It's a Sunday that we celebrate because it means that Jesus is all-powerful, that Jesus has things under control, and that Jesus watches over us. It is a fantastic Sunday because it allows us to remember that no matter what we see, no matter what is going on, no matter what is happening, that our King, the true King, the King of all kings, Emperor of all emperors, Lord of all lords, is Jesus, who, as we said earlier, was born as poor as can be in a stable, lived a poor life, died on a cross with criminals, but then was resurrected, the greatest king of all, to save us. I think we should sing again, and so we're going to look for uh, hymn number 426, All Heaven Declares, and hopefully it will be a more familiar tune this time, uh, 426, All Heaven Declares. <laughs> The Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one 
with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon from Mount Miser. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. And the reading from the New Testament is taken from Matthew chapter 25, reading verses 1 to 13. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in the jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Amen. May God add his blessings to these readings of his word. Uh, last week, we were talking about discipleship, about what it means to be a disciple, how it's not just about following, but about studying. And this week, we're actually talking about discipleship again. And there may be some similar themes that come through. The reading from Matthew comes, toward, or, or comes towards the end of a section where Jesus and the disciples are talking about the future and about the second coming. When Jesus will return and when the kingdom has been fulfilled, when they'll meet God in person. They discuss the destruction of the temple, the signs of the end time, and have a conversation about how we can never know when this will happen. It's a context that's important to our understanding of what this parable, the one that we normally call the ten virgins, means. After all, the parable starts with the phrase, at that time. So we need to know what that time is. It's the time of the coming of the kingdom, the fulfillment of God's plan. So apparently, it's like ten virgins. Although, within this context, although that is literally what it means, it might be more appropriate to think of them as young women. Or in a more modern context, bridesmaids. You see, it was the job at that time of a group of young people known to the bride to meet the bridegroom. Uh, meet the bridegroom and prepare him and bring him in to the wedding reception. It would have been done late, uh, late at night as the groom would have set off at first dark. They were, for our purposes, bridesmaids. Now, we're told that five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. 
because the wise ones took spare oil for their torches and the others didn't. Now, the groom should really have arrived on time. We all know that in terms of weddings, brides being a wee bit late is almost expected. Grooms being late is uh, more of a problem. But our groom doesn't at all. Um, he doesn't arrive on time and he arrives so super late that before he does, all of the bridesmaids fall asleep. But late at night, unexpectedly, he arrives. His party let off wild cheers, letting everyone know he has come and the bridesmaids get their torches going again. They go out to meet him, but the foolish ones can't. They can't see what they're doing, so they have to go and buy some oil. And as a result, they miss the wedding banquet. They bang on the door, but the groom tells them, I don't know you. The moral of this story is, we are again told, keep watch, because we don't know when we will be standing at the door of heaven, waiting to see if God knows us. It's a parable that, at first glance, is a lot like all of the other keep watch parables. Keep watch, you might not get another chance, be ready for God. Don't leave it till your deathbed, because you don't know when that's going to be. But this parable is a wee bit different in its focus. You see here, the bridesmaids are all waiting on the groom, in full expectation that the groom will arrive. The foolish and the wise alike. They're both in the same position, especially since they all fall asleep. They're expecting the groom and they're looking for the groom and they all drop the ball. They're all surprised, not at how soon the groom comes, but at how late the groom comes. But five of them are ready for that wait with the lamps full, and five of them are not. In most of these parables, Jesus tells us that we should expect God and be ready to welcome God. That's the requirement that is listed. Expect God, be welcome to ready, be welcome to, be ready to welcome God. But this one's more complex, because on that most basic requirement, they all pass. All of them were waiting outside that house. All of them wanted to welcome the groom. They were all doing what they were meant to. But it's not enough. Knowing that God's coming is not enough. We have to be ready as well. We have to fill our lamps. When our bridesmaids are waiting to see, our, when our foolish bridesmaids get to the door, they bang on it and say, let us in. We're here for the banquet. And God responds, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Now there is some indication that this phrase, I don't know you, was a, a formula commonly used with masters and disciples as a way of denying access to the master. As we're talking about disciples, it would maybe work a wee bit like this, that a follower who had committed some great sin or was being expelled from the group would be greeted with that phrase. It is not a literal, I don't know who you are. It is a literal, you are not part of what I am any longer. But I think in this context, that phrase takes on more relevance. Because you see, what this parable alludes to and what is made clear in the Gospels is that our saving, that our meeting God, that our entrance to heaven is predicated not upon simple knowledge, but upon relationship. 
God knows us and we know God. In this parable, it is not enough that we simply are there. We have to have full lamps. We spoke last week about how following was the most basic level of trust, the most basic level. And again here, expecting is the most basic level. What, however, we need is that next level of preparation. Last week we said it was about study. This week, well, it still is, but it's about a bit more than that as well. What does it mean to fill our lamps? What does it mean to have that oil so that when we are standing there in front of God, God will know us and welcome us as a friend? The first thing I have to say is that what it means is that we must have an active and lived faith. We must have a faith that is based upon God and relationship with God, not simply knowledge. We must also have a relationship in which we get to know God, and study is a part of that. But so are doing the things that God wants us to do. Those interactions we have with the people around us those things that we spend our time on, they are important in filling our lamps. I was having a conversation with one of my children just the other day. We were talking about why it's important for them to eat properly and healthily. They've been told, you are what you eat. Yes, that's somewhat true, but you can see how it could also be confusing for a child. If they eat like a YouTuber, will that mean they become a YouTuber? If they eat like Mo Farah, will they become one of the fastest people on earth? No, of course not. We had this conversation that they have to fill themselves with good things with vitamins and minerals and fruits and veggies and not just with sugar all of the time. The same is true here. If we view our souls as being that jar of oil, it's important that we fill them, but also with the right stuff. It is not a parable that Jesus told, but it could easily be if we think, that the wise bridesmaids filled their oil lamps with oil and the foolish ones filled them with everything else. The outcome would be the same. One would be able to relight their lamp and the other would not. We must fill ourselves with God, devote ourselves to that relationship. Prayer, reading our Bible, studying the Word, acting on that Word, living lives that are full of God, this is what we must do. It seems like a lot. I know that it seems like a lot. But that's where our Old Testament reading comes in. It's a psalm that's probably more known as a hymn, but it is a psalm. As the deer pants for the water, so I pant for you. The deer at the stream thirsts and so drinks. It is not an odious duty. It is refreshing. How many of us have been off on a long walk, especially in the summer, have come home and we're parched, thirsty, in need of a drink pouring yourself that glass of water and drowning and downing it. It isn't an odious task. It is not something that we dread. It is not something that 
takes all the energy that we have or time that we resent that we could have spent on something else. It is a joy. It nourishes and refreshes. It dies down that thirst. We are all made with souls that thirst for God. And as we thirst for God, and we thirst for presence with God, as we thirst for the knowledge filling, fulfilling that need, it is not a chore. It is a joy. It is hard to be fully at peace when we are thirsty or we are hungry. And it is hard to be impossible to be fully at peace when we thirst for God and do nothing about it. That thirst for God, that wish to know God more, that need and desire deep within us to connect with our Creator, to connect with the one who created us and loves us and saved us and redeems us and wants to be with us forever, that burning desire leads us to do works that God would approve of, leads us to pray, leads us to sing, leads us to fill our lives with God. And as we do, it is a beautiful and joyous thing. Sometimes it is easier than others, but we always see the benefit. Last year, I went on a retreat with some people that I train with. We went and spent 48 hours in silence. It's a very ancient spiritual practice, and one which, as I'm sure you can imagine, I struggle with. For the first 24 hours, it was really tough. Not speaking at all. Not listening to music or having TV. Not having anyone else speak to you. It's tough. But after a day of it, it becomes easier. After 30 hours, it became joyous. By the end of the 48 hours, it was strange to engage in that chit-chat. And what I had spent in that time doing was praying and reading, and I felt so refreshed. Sometimes being a disciple of God, sometimes filling our lamp with that oil is tough. But as we do it, we refresh ourselves. When we do it, we find ourselves closer to God and we find ourselves amazing. It is the greatest feeling. It is the greatest thing because we are built for it. My encouragement to you this Sunday is fill your life with God. Desire God as the deer pants for water. Fill your lives with study, with prayer, with reading. And in your every interaction, reflect God's glory because that is what is needed. So that not just will we feel God's peaceful presence upon us now, but that when we meet God ourselves, we will not be turned away, but God will say, come in, good friend, I have been expecting you. Amen. We're going to sing that psalm now in the form that it's probably more familiar with you as the hymn 550, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you.
Let us pray. Our Lord, we thank you for our Lord. We thank you for your presence in our lives, for the relationship we can build in you, for the times that you are there when no one else is, for the times when you are there when we are in a crowd. Our Lord, as we study you, devote ourselves to you in prayer and in reading, as we become true disciples of you, we thank you. We thank you for all that you do in our lives, for all that you teach us, for all that we know. Our Lord, there are so many people in this world who need your help, people who need your presence and your wisdom. We pray for leaders leaders who have the fate of so many in their hands, that they should choose the way of peace, the way of compassion, the way of protection, that they should serve all and not just themselves. We pray for all of those who fight or work for peace and justice in our world. Bless them. Bless them and hold them up in your sight and grant them peace. We pray for those who are ill or sick, those who are in hospital. We pray that your healing hands would descend upon them and give them full life. Our Lord, we pray for our weeks ahead. We pray that whether they are busy or quiet, whether they contain joys or challenges, that you would be there, right next to us at every step. We pray that we would face them, showing your love, reflecting your light, and always looking for your presence. Our God, as we think about you ruling on high, and as we think upon your disciples, we come together using the words that your Son taught us in prayer. As we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're about to sing our last hymn. Uh, just before we do, um, let me please um, extend an invite to everyone here to join us for tea and coffee afterwards, served over there. Uh, a great time to get to know each other, have a chat, and have a gossip. Um, let's sing our last hymn. It's number 154, How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
and may the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit, be upon you all, now and forevermore. Thank you.